We talked about it is one half of, of this Christian lifestyle. We allowed Scripture to call us into a life of holiness, a life of taking up our crosses and following after Jesus. We heard some words from John Wesley about the important role of the life of prayer, the role of, of searching Scripture, the, the role of, of, of being in worship and of, of taking Holy Communion, taking the sacrament, and what that means for our, the personal side of our spiritual life. We were reminded of this twofold action of, of personal holiness and, and social holiness, of, of holiness of what's going on inside of our hearts and, and holiness that is lived out with our lives. And we were reminded that, that it's like breathing. Both actions, breathing in and breathing out, are important. Isn't that right, Doc? If, they, if one of those stops, it's trouble, right? Either one, it doesn't matter. We were reminded of a quote from Eddie Fox that says that, that we know which one is more important, breathing in or breathing out, when we know which one of the two we did last. That next one is the most important. Both actions are equally important. And I think this articulates what's expressed in in, in our, our book of discipline. And, and some of you know that, that we have as, as the United Methodist Church a, a, a book alongside Scripture that guides who we are and, and how we live in community. And, and, and the first... ninety pages, except for the Constitution, are, are pretty good reads. I mean, unless you like reading legal documents and then, uh, Joseph, the Constitution might be for you to just flip through and uh, learn things you never really wanted to know about the United Methodist Church. Uh, but, but then there's a section of, of theology and history, just kind of our core basic beliefs. The rest of it, if you have insomnia, I would offer to you uh, to, to pick up for some bedside reading. Uh, but there's some, some, some core in there about who we are as, as Christians. And, and one of the paragraphs in there, it, it says that our struggles with human dignity and social reform have been a response to God's demand for love, to God's demand for mercy and justice in light of the kingdom of God. And it says that we proclaim no personal gospel that fails to express itself in relevant social concerns. And it says that we proclaim no social gospel that does not include the personal transformation of sinners. Remember last week I, I shared with you a, a version of my personal mission statement and it's a, a version of the United Methodist mission statement to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And I added for my own being by being a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. As a, as a reminder to me that, that if I want to be a part of what God is doing in this world, it's got to start here. It's got to start in my heart. It's got to start with me. And then I begin to live it out with my hands and my life. There are two scripture passages that are going to guide our conversation this morning around this lifestyle of holiness. And the first is Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. And it reads, Wash, be clean, remove your ugly deeds from my sight, put an end to such evil, learn to do good, Seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And the second selection of Scripture comes from James, a, a verse at the end of the first chapter, and then a chunk in the middle of the second chapter, and it reads, True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their difficulties and to keep the world from contaminating us. And continuing in verse 14, it reads, My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or a sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you says, Go in peace and stay warm and have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead if it does not result in faithful activity. 
Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action, but, but how can I see your faith apart from your action? Instead, I will show you my faith by putting it into practice and faithful action. It's good that you believe that God is one. <laughs> Even demons believe this, and they tremble in fear. Are you so slow? Do you need to be shown that faith without actions has no value at all? What about Abraham, our father? Wasn't he shown to be righteous through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See, his faith was at work along with his actions. In fact, his faith was made complete by his faithful actions. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and God regarded him as righteous. What is more, Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions and not through faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute shown to be righteous when she received the messengers as her guest and then sent them on by another road? As the lifeless body is dead, so faith without actions is dead. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Each of these passages, at least for me, they're difficult to hear. You can take that down, Caleb. To me, they're difficult to hear because they're convicting. It's easy to talk about personal piety because, well, it's personal. And, and I convince myself that because it's personal, that also means it's private. Anybody with me? And when I convince myself that something is private, that means I need to isolate it. And I found that when I begin to isolate, instead of bringing it closer to me, all I've done is create room for the evil one to creep in a part of my life that should be holy. We like to talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and don't get me wrong, Christ longs to be in a personal, transformative relationship with each and every one of us. God desires that relationship, but we tend to leave our faith there. We might take up our cross for a fleeting moment, but we forget about the follow me part. We like to talk about how Jesus went away in, in solitude, that He would go and pray by Himself, but we forget that He existed in community for the majority of His life, that He surrounded Himself with His followers, with His friends, with His faith community. We like to forget that part because... You see, if I've got people around me, if I let people into that part of my life, they might know that I, I don't pray like I say I pray. They, they might know that, that I'm not reading my Bible like I should be. If I, if I let people into that part of my life, they might begin to hold me accountable for my actions outside of, of 1045 to noon on Sunday mornings. Somebody else with me? If I let people in my life, they might, they might start holding me accountable to the way I live, and then I might, I might actually start living out what I say that I believe, and then I might actually start believing what I claim, and, and, and by golly, my life might get transformed, and my heart might change, and I might start living out this gospel of Jesus. And that scares me a little bit. This breathing out. This idea of, of social holiness, of holiness of the life, is such an important part of our Christian life because it reminds us that this gospel is bigger than me and mine and I. It reminds us that Jesus came that everyone might have life and have it abundantly. For God so loved the world. Remember? We see God's grace and human activity working together in a relationship of faith and good works. 
God's grace calls forth a human response and discipline. Now, faith is the only response necessary for salvation. We cannot work our way into salvation. We believe that only faith through Jesus Christ can do that. But Wesley reminds us that, that when we have an authentic version of faith, a, a, a true level of faith, that that begins to be lived out through faithful action. And in the early Methodist movement, they, they didn't have churches, but they would gather together in groups. And, and Wesley would gather groups together this size or larger for society meetings. And basically it was a big Bible study every week. And then he would divide those societies up into classes. And those were smaller groups where you would have a little more intense Bible study. And then he would divide those intense Bible studies up into accountability groups or what they would call bands. And those would be the groups where you would share your heart and it would be a group of men if you were if you're a man it would be a group of women if you are a woman and, and those would be the groups where you would sit down and you would get to know somebody and you'd look them in the eye and you would go how is it with your soul and you would know when they weren't answering right because you had developed a relationship and you could call them on it that's dangerous stuff there so, so Wesley was all about having a, a life of faith, having this personal relationship, but he said we need to begin to be living it out. And so he offered some rules, and we call these general rules of, of the Methodist church, and, and they're really simple. Do no harm. Everybody agree that's good? What's the number one rule of a physician? Do no harm. The second rule is, is to do good. Also a good thing, right? And the third is to, to stay in love with God. Wesley phrased that to attend to the ordinances of God. And then doing no harm meant, uh, meant, meant staying away from things like uh, drunkenness or, or slander. In fact, he even took a stance against slavery. Think about that for a moment. 1700s, mid to late. This... English preacher is saying that slavery is wrong. He's in England. Do no harm. He said do good by caring for those that are in need, not only with their, their bodily needs, making sure that they have clothing and food, but also tending to their spiritual needs. Praying with people, reading scripture with people, offering yourself in relationship on behalf of Jesus Christ with people. And then the last rule was just was just showing up to worship. It was reading scripture, it was being in prayer for one another. I made a, a promise to to one of our youth. Well, she actually called me on it. And she said, I'm not going to come on Sunday because I'm going to get in late for band competition. And I said, well, this is what the sermon's about, and if you don't show up, I'm going to call you. And uh, if you know me, I keep my promises. And so we'll see if she answers. And I'm just going just to encourage her to read James 2. I'm going to guess that she doesn't answer. Wesley said that repentance, this life of faith, should be accompanied by fruits meant for repentance. That, that this life should be lived out in, in means that, that show that we have had some kind of change in our hearts. Both faith and works, they belong within this all-encompassing grace of God. They stem from God's gracious love for us. Hey, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we talked about the general rules at church and one of those was coming to worship and uh, that we read James 2 and uh, that we missed you and I hope you sleep well and I'm glad that you won your band competition. Bye. She told me I wouldn't do it. This idea of faith and works, they belong within this all-encompassing theology of grace. They stem from God's generous and gracious love in this world that has been shed on our hearts. 
As the United Methodist Church, we insist that personal salvation always involves Christian mission and service to this world. By the joining of heart and hand, we assert that personal religion and evangelical witness and Christian social action are reciprocal. That they're mutually reinforcing that it's a part of one life. We believe that personal piety, this, this love of God inside of our hearts, is always linked together with love of neighbor. That love of God and love of neighbor, they go together. We believe that our thoughts about God, our, our study of God, we believe that that serves to, to deepen our relationship with God. And that deeper relationship, that compels us into a life of, of Christian conscience, of Christian action. We believe that this life of Christian action is, is filled with social action and interaction that in, is empowered by the reign of God in this world that is participating in the activity of the Holy Spirit. John Wesley described prayer and searching scriptures, holy communion, and, and other action as, as acts of piety. He would refer to this other side of the Christian life as acts of mercy. Wesley believed that these acts of mercy exercised Christian tempers. Now, I've got a temper, but I wouldn't call it Christian all the time. Ever. Um, but, but what he meant by Christian tempers is just Christian actions. A Christian lifestyle. And, and like any form of exercise, improvement could be expected uh, when you do it. You told me that you got a, an invitation to, uh, to talk to a school about playing baseball. You, you learn to play baseball by repeating motions over and over again, right? You learn to, to bat by practicing your swing. You learn to pitch and to throw by practicing your mechanics. You're training your body to act and react in certain ways. And Wesley was suggesting, he was reminding us, I would say, that Christian action, living out our faith in this world, it helps us to practice what Jesus practiced. It helps us to, to practice and to exercise what Christ is calling us to, and then eventually that just becomes second nature. So that when the ball's hit to you, your glove goes to the ground. And you're able to catch it and field it and make the play. So if the love of God looks like worship and prayer and searching scriptures, if it looks like holy communion and being in relationship, what does the love of others look like? When I was doing my study this week, I was reminded of a, a passage of scripture from Luke 10 where a question very similar came up. And one of the legal experts said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Remember that story? I would say that these acts of mercy, that the love of others can fall anywhere in the range of, of actions that contribute to the, to the general welfare of others. From the person sitting next to you today, or behind you. Go ahead, you can look. All of you. You can look left and right, maybe behind you. It may mean that you need to reach out to that person. It may be the person that, that you pass walking to your car, or standing on the street corner. It may be a child in foster care. Or as Luke 10 reminds us, it may be one of our worst enemies. Maybe it looks like securing clothing or shelter or health care or education. Maybe this action of, of, of living out acts of mercy for you gets played out through a ministry of this church providing food for the hungry on, on Mondays or Fridays or providing furniture on Wednesdays for those who are in need. Maybe it looks like delivering firewood as an act of grace and relationship. Maybe it means getting your hands wet and reaching into a sink and washing the hair of someone that you've never met before through halo haircuts. 
Maybe it means serving on a building project through Carpenter's Helpers or going on one of our short-term mission trips. Maybe you have a calling in your life, like many people in this church, to love children in need of a family through fostering or adoption. If that's a, a call on your life, I would love to, to get you in contact with some people who I know that, are, that have that calling, and that's a very powerful calling in, in who they are. Did you see the, the story about the boy in Florida who, who walked up in front of a church? I guess it was two weeks ago now. And, and he said, I, I just need a home. I just need someone to call my family. My heart broke for that little boy and apparently that church has been flooded with responses and telephone calls of people saying that they would be happy to adopt that young man. Maybe your act of mercy comes through tackling systemic issues that perpetuate homelessness and drug addiction and hunger and school dropout rates. And maybe you tackle that through political involvement at the local and state and national level. But I want to encourage us all to not wait for someone else to be the solution to a problem. You see, each of us, each and every one of us can have a difference in at least one person's life today and tomorrow and the next day. You may be the only smile that someone sees today. You may be the only person in someone's life who expresses love to them. Dad told me a story once, and he was on a, a Kairos weekend at, at, at a prison, and that's an Emmaus ministry that happens within the walls of a prison, and they were in Mountain City, and, and a part of that ministry, there's a, a, a birthday cake presented to all of the men in prison, and, and, and Dad is six seven, and he said this man was bigger than he was, tall and wide, and, and, and this man just started boohooing. And, and if you don't know anything about big guys, uh, we cry a lot. And when we cry, we cry hard. And this man was just boohooing. And they, they kind of surrounded him and, and wrapped him up in love and support. And he said, no one has ever celebrated my birthday before. No one had ever given him a token to say, I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad that I can be with you today. Do you get birthday cakes? Maybe a present or two, too? I did. It's nice, right? You may be the only Jesus that someone encounters today. Maybe your act of mercy is as simple as, is as dangerously satisfying as offering yourself in friendship. Opening yourself to the power of relationship. It can be that simple. It can be that messy. It can be that rewarding. I took a group of uh, high school seniors and juniors to go experience a campus ministry in North Carolina on Sunday and Monday, and we were running late, and, and uh, we had to eat really fast, and we ran into a Wendy's in, in Carborough, North Carolina. And, and in Carborough uh, stood a man, and I don't think I've told you this, um, stood a man that I had a relationship with about four or five years ago when he came through the church that we were working at, and his, his name is Doc. And, and Doc has seen about the worst of what uh, humanity has to offer. He was a part of Hell's Angels for the majority of his life. Uh, at the time that I left him, he was 63 years old, and he looked 73 or 83, and he had spent 40-plus years of his life in prison, and, and he had told me that he'd even killed a few people. And he came up to me and uh, started telling me stories, and most of the stories included profanity and, and uh, at a level I had not heard in some time. And uh, He was also sharing with me that he had kind of fallen off the wagon, that his struggle with addiction had gotten the best of him, but that he was going to meetings again, and he, had, he thinks that he's back on the right track, but it's tough. And uh, That's not the word he used, but I'm not going to share that with you. 
And there was a lady sitting with him. A, a lady had bought his hamburger and she was a member at that church and had been in relationship with him for some time. Not, not any kind of romantic relationship, but a deep Christian relationship where Doc would stray. He would struggle and she'd come back and she'd make sure that he'd have clothes on his back and food in his belly and rides to the meetings that he needed. It can be messy. But you can also see God's hand unfold right before your eyes in miraculous ways. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let us exercise our holiness in order that we might become more and more like Jesus. Let, let us become less in order that He might become more. Let us love God in order that we might love others and let us love others in order that we might more deeply express our love of God. If this discussion has, has stirred something in you, maybe you've got a question, maybe you're saying, I, I, I feel like I need to be a part of something that is doing this. Know that Mickey or I, one, would love to talk with you more about this. You could call Danny or, or Susie in the missions office and they can get you plugged into one of the many acts of mercy that happen in this building and through this church each and every week. It takes breathing in and it takes breathing out. And when we're living in this pattern, in and out, the movement of the Holy Spirit becomes a part of the movement of our lives. And we're transformed into a disciple who is seeking transformation for this world. Not for our own good. Not for our own power. But to see what the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of God looks like here and now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.